Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Empty Cloud Monastery. This evening, we're happy to have with us Ajahn Bramali again, who's been here for a few days. And this morning, we'll be uh, sharing a Dhamma talk on right view. Uh, so, Ajahn Bramali is the um, admin of Bodhinyana, uh, so one of the uh, major forest monasteries in Australia and the uh, home base of Ajahn Brahm. Um, so, we're Delighted to have Ajahn with us. Whenever you're ready, Ajahn, you can oh, excellent. Some words of Okay, thank you, Venerable. I'm not actually the co-abbot. I'm, I'm just a minion, one of the minions of uh, the other <laughs> monastery. Yeah. It's much better to be a minion than to be a co-abbot. <laughs> <So. laughs> but uh, anyway, so yes, thank you for that. And uh, we're going to talk a bit about the idea of... Uh, this is the camera, is that right? Yes. So, okay. Hello, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, uh, talk a bit about the idea of uh, right view, specifically the difference between right view and no view, uh, because uh, it is sometimes assumed in Buddhism that it's good to have no view at all. Uh, and it turns out, when you look at the sutta, that that actually is not really what the Buddha is talking about. Uh, and so it's good to make this distinction. Uh, and uh, we know that from the Buddhist path, we know that the whole practice of the Noble Eightfold Path starts out with right view. Yes, yeah, so obviously it is important uh, because that sets the direction for your life. It sets the purpose for your life, the goal, the aim, where we're heading. Uh, and without that idea of where we're going, uh, having a sense of direction, basically nothing really happens. Uh, and I always like the ideas of just the very simple similes from ordinary life where you, you know, you uh, kind of tradition. The simile I often use is the idea of investing on the stock market. Uh, if you have wrong ideas about where to invest, you think that a certain company is doing well when actually it is on the verge of bankruptcy. Uh, yeah, and sometimes we have misunderstanding that you could call wrong view. It is not aligned with reality. And if it isn't aligned with reality, well, then you have a problem. You make bad decisions, uh, you lose your money, and then you jump off a tall building afterwards. Uh, that happens sometimes with people, and that's called dukkha. That's one aspect of dukkha, jumping off tall buildings. Uh, not mentioned in the suttas, but nevertheless, it is, uh, <laughs> it is there. <laughs> so uh, this is... Uh, the, uh, this is the problem with the wrong view. We make bad decisions if we have wrong views. So seeing things rightly is actually very important. Uh, and so right view, what it really means, it, we can look at this in many different ways, uh, but it means to align our view with the way the Buddha saw the world. Uh, because our assumption is that the Buddha saw the world as it actually is. So we try to align our views as much as we can with the way the Buddha saw the world. Uh, and of course, the Buddha, the way he saw the world was a, he understood the distinction between happiness and suffering. That's why he found the highest happiness. So that's another way of thinking about the right view, is actually understanding where suffering is and where happiness is, and then heading towards happiness rather than heading towards suffering. Yeah, This is where we normally, most people head, they head towards suffering. And that is kind of the, uh, the big problem with the wrong view. So what is actually going on, there's a, because there are a few suttas, especially in the Atakavaga or the Sutta Nipata, where the Buddha says things like giving up all views. So what does it mean to give up all views in that kind of particular context? And because that, that is often where people have this idea that they shouldn't, you shouldn't have any views. But then again, he talked about has samaditi, so what's going on here? I should also mention that uh, uh, the stream mentor is called a ditti patto, or ditti patta, which means one who has attained to view. So it seems obvious that there is such a thing as right view, right? How can you be attained to view if there are no views? Uh, so we need to be careful when we look at these uh, specific statements in the Atakavaga, what it actually means. Uh, and what it seems to mean when you look at the context, uh, it doesn't mean that you don't have any views. Uh, it means that you don't hold on to any views. Uh, yeah, and that's a very big difference, not having any views. Uh, and especially in the context of the Atakavaga, we're talking about very profound ideas of the Dhamma. Huh? So not holding on to any views basically means being a stream enter. Huh? And the reason why you don't hold on to any views as a stream enter is because you know the views and no need to hold on anymore, no need to grasp or attach. You know the reality. Huh? So, not, so you have right view, so not holding on is kind of becomes a... It's irrelevant. You don't hold on. You just have it. And so this is what it, the idea of giving up views is that you kind of are, you're not so attached to them and you're, you don't really grasp them so much. And this is, uh, 
for true for the stream entry in the highest sense, but I think all of us is kind of good to remember not holding on too much to our views uh, because it just leads to arguments down the track, it leads to problems. So the Buddha says a few places in the suttas, he, he says that I don't argue with the world, it's the world that argues with me. Yeah, yeah? And that's kind of a beautiful saying because the world is full of opinions. So. But the Buddha, he says, whatever, you know, it's, it's, your, <laughs> it's your problem, not mine. I kind of ended suffering. So uh, whatever you think is uh, suitably here. <laughs> <laughs> and that's kind of a nice way of thinking about these things. So less view, sometimes I'm not holding our views so strongly. And even as Buddhists, even though we may believe in rebirth, we have confidence in rebirth, it doesn't mean we go around arguing strongly in favor of rebirth, because at the end, usually that shows your own lack of conviction if you argue strongly, right? I mean, if you really think there is rebirth and you feel confident about that, you don't really care what other people think. It's kind of irrelevant. Uh, but if you are unsure in yourself, that is often when we argue the most. Uh, because insecurity in ourselves actually makes us argue with others uh, because we want to prove the point of view to ourselves very often. Uh, for someone who is relaxed about these things, they, you know, they, and uh, actually it's a far better approach to this. Uh, and that often that is also when we do convince others, yeah? Because then they kind of, it's this idea, they become a bit more aware of their own views. If we argue back, uh, then we're giving them the ammunition to argue against us again, because that's kind of how these things are. But if we don't argue back, then I think then they kind of become a bit more self-conscious. Wait a minute, what's going on here? <laughs> and then maybe they will change because of that, uh, sometimes anyway. So uh, what do we do before we become stream enters? How do we kind of tackle this idea of right view in the meantime? Uh, and uh, one of the... Um, important thing is to remember about views is that you have to have views. There's not such thing as giving up views entirely. Yeah, we have to have certain attachments. We have to have certain holdings on. And this comes from the idea as independent origination. You have Vedana, Pachaya, Tanha. Yeah, feeling is the condition for craving. Tanha, Pachaya, Upadana. Craving is the condition for Upadana. Upadana is attachment, holding on, taking up, these kind of the ideas. Uh, so, the, and one of the upadanas in this in, uh, independent origination is, is a ditti upadana, ditti upadana, the holding on to views. So, as long as you are not a stream enter, uh, as long as you are not an arahant for sure, uh, you have to have those views because this dependent origination is still working for you. Uh, yeah, you're still kind of on this treadmill of being reborn and going round and round. So Ditti Upadana is a fundamental aspect of existence, not something you can just give up. So instead of trying to give up views entirely, which is impossible, we should again channel our views in the right direction. Make sure we hold on to the right kind of things, yeah? Not dodgy views, but good views. So, and this is kind of interesting throughout the Buddhist path. We talk about giving up all the negative aspects of existence, yeah, which are um, uh, wrong views or, or views, cravings, attachments, uh, all of these kind of things. Uh, but And uh, mana, like uh, conceit, uh, yeah, all of these things have to be given up ultimately. But all of these things are also inherent to existence. Uh, and because they are inherent, not to existence, to, to um, worldly existence, yeah, to before you become an arahant. And because they are inherent to us, uh, we need to channel them in such a way that they lead towards awakening here. Yeah. Craving, you know, okay, we have to crave. There's no choice about it. Uh, so you crave in the right way. Uh, you channel the craving in the right direction. You reduce the bad cravings, give rise to some more wholesome cravings. Uh, same thing with attachments. Uh, same thing even with conceit. Okay, who am I? Okay, I'm going to be at least a good person. I'm going to identify as a good person rather than identify as a, you know, wh whatever. Uh, and then you, we are using those inherent aspects of ordinary existence uh, and channel them in a good way so they become uh, supports uh, for our practice. Uh, and the same thing is true of views. Uh, you have no choice. You have to have views. Uh, so we try to align our views uh, with the views, the way the Buddha looked at the world. Uh, and uh, just this idea uh, that our views come from feelings uh, is just really interesting. Uh, yeah? I, I always found this so interesting because it's so against how the kind of conceit we normally have about ourselves. Yeah, my views are rational. Yeah, your views are irrational, but my views, they are rational. How can you believe that? <laughs> and of course, we believe our own views are rational. And that's fine. It's nothing, we have to, otherwise it would be crazy to hold those views. 
But uh, still, at the end of the day, it's very useful to remember, actually, it arises from feelings. Those views feel good to us, and that's why we hold on to them. And once you see that, uh, kind of, it's almost like, it's, it's almost like you want to reject all your views, right? Because if you hold them because of blooming feelings, it's like, uh, it, it just feels good to me, so I hold it. It's kind of terrible, right? We, we want to be rational. We don't want to be these emotional creatures who just hold on to stuff for good, stupid reasons. Uh, that's actually what we're doing here. Yeah. <laughs> and, this, and so this kind of undermines the whole idea of our views a little bit. And that's good. Yes, yeah? that means we hold on to them less if you understand that they come from this irrational side in us, uh, which just needs something to hold on to. Uh, and a large part of the view is, well, they come from the sense of self. Yeah. Sense of self is a given for a Putujana and, and, and a worldling. Yeah. Um, so that sense of self is a given. Yeah. And because that sense of self is a given, that sense of self, uh, it uh, doesn't stay just like a, a kind of simple idea inside of us. Uh, no, that sense of self wants to be gratified in the world. Uh, and the way it is gratified is by uh, you know, taking positions and by thinking of itself and trying to understand who am I and you want to kind of decide who you are so you feel more solid because sometimes the I am feeling is there but it feels kind of amorphous. You don't really know who you are. So that sense of self wants to be gratified by finding out who it actually is. And then you start grasping onto doctrines, uh, annihilationism, eternalism, these kind of things. Uh, yeah? And you kind of hold on to things in the world. Even maybe political positions also have a lot to do with the sense of self. Yeah? You identify with something for a particular reason. And uh, how solid are these political opinions people have? They're really hollow, yeah? People go from being a communist, a socialist, to being a right-wing fanatic, you know, and they kind of fluctuate between these things in their life. And it's kind of, there's nothing really there. And each time they change, I think, now I've got the right thing. Yeah. We never learn. <laughs> so the sense of self is really the root of the problem, as with so many other things. The sense of self kind of leeches into the world, and it kind of then grasps onto things uh, and, uh, and it makes these things into solid views for some reason or other. Uh, so it's really, uh, really problematic. And this way of thinking uh, kind of undermines the idea of uh, uh, views uh, quite powerfully. Uh. So uh, this is the idea of views. So again, how do we, what do we do then? And what we do, and this is where what becomes quite interesting, is that we then say, well, what did the Buddha say? You have confidence in the Buddha, right? Because, well, he was... Uh, Pretty, he was quite a remarkable person, uh, to say the least. That's a bit of an understatement. Um, but he, so you start to then say, well, if the Buddha said these things, okay, maybe I should take these things on as a temporary hypothesis uh, and then see what happens as a consequence. Uh, so you can see here that your views uh, are very closely aligned with the idea of confidence, uh, right? You have confidence in the Buddha, and so you take on these views. But basically, it's really just confidence in something here. Uh, is it a view? Yeah, it is a view, but it's also just confidence. So in Buddhism, sadha and ditti here are very closely related to each other. Here. They can barely be, be kind of pulled apart properly. Here. You have confidence, faith, and that confidence and faith leads you to accept certain things about the world, or certain views and things. And that, of course, is also related to panya, panya wisdom, because the more closely, the more you stronger your confidence becomes as you start to uncover these teachings in your heart, in the way you live, the closer you get to the panya, the wisdom of the Buddha. So confidence leads to wisdom. And when, when wisdom becomes fully established, we talked about stream entry before, when your views are established, at that point is when your confidence becomes complete. So sadha, confidence, um, Wisdom, confidence, right view, all of these things kind of revolve around each other huh? and they're not that different from each other. Huh? And this is quite unique, I think, to Buddhism. Huh? The idea that wisdom huh? and confidence... Huh? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> wisdom. <laughs> That's very, very nice. Okay. <laughs> so confidence and wisdom in Buddhism, they grow together here. Huh? as does right view. Huh? And these things kind of, kind of emerge out of this, uh, you know, starting with the suttas, having some confidence in the Buddha, and they kind of grow together in this way. Huh? So right view is just an aspect of confidence. Uh, confidence is an aspect of panya. They all revolve around each other. Huh? Makes Buddhism very special because uh, most religions, or some religions that we know, is really about faith, yeah? And whether it makes any sense or not is kind of irrelevant. Uh, and that is 
nuts from a Buddhist point of view. It has to make sense. Yeah? Otherwise, how can you believe things that don't make sense? That's, that's kind of a cop-out from a Buddhist point of view, and it's very dangerous. Uh, if you're wrong, yeah, well, you're going to suffer enormously because of that. Uh, so these other teachings are really asking for, you're asking for suffering if you hold on to things that have a, a hollow, uh, don't have a solid foundation. Uh. So um, this is uh, the idea of uh, views, yeah? So you don't take them so seriously. Uh, you understand that they are relative. Uh, you understand that they come from feelings and from this uh, I, I am uh, idea. Um, but what this also means, uh, because it comes from confidence, it means that views have a large variety in, uh, of um, uh, de degrees to them, right? A view can be very weak. It can be something that you, you believe in maybe a little bit, or you, maybe you believe, but you don't really understand what's going on. And you can view can become stronger. You see things more in accordance with reality. It starts to increase in you. So it comes in this enormous amount of degrees, starting from zero all the way to 100%, which is Dittipato. And all of us, we're somewhere in the middle here, somewhere. Huh? And so what we want to do, we want to go up this ladder. We want to get closer to the real right view. Huh? This is what we're trying to do here. Huh? So what, how do we do this? And uh, the way, one of the ways of doing this, of course, is to contemplate the teachings on right view that you find in the suttas. What does it actually mean? A, a basic idea of right view in the suttas is the idea of rebirth. Yeah? So how can we contemplate the idea of rebirth? And um, one of the, there's many ways you can do that. We can just read the suttas and you can kind of see what the Buddha has to say about these things. And you, after a while, you, either you reject it or you kind of come to agree with it. But um, it is also one of the things that I like to do sometimes is to read books about people who have experiences in the world that are different from the ordinary. And uh, I don't read very many books, but occasionally I, I might read a book apart from the suttas, which I read a lot. Uh, but uh, sometimes you come across beautiful descriptions of people who have near-death experiences or, or these sort of things, yeah, or children who remember past lives and all of these kind of things. Yeah. And when you read them and you see real people talking about their experiences, uh, you can't really reject it. Yeah, how can you reject someone saying, well, this is what happened to me. Uh, do we have any grounds for rejecting that? Uh, and then you start to look at it. Uh, and maybe you do some scientific research on it uh, as a... Uh, some of these research at, at the University of Virginia do, uh, and you look at the results, and actually it's very powerful evidence uh, that something is very interesting is happening uh, at the end of a human life. Uh. And sometimes when you read some of these stories, uh, because they are real stories, they are emotionally powerful. Uh. Sometimes I find the suit as, you know, the right view, there is this life, there is the other life. Uh. Okay, good, but it doesn't really touch you very deeply. It's like, okay, it's like an intellectual uh, <laughs> ascent to something. It doesn't have any much emotional impact. Uh, but when you read real stories of people, they say, well, this transformed my life. Uh, I became different when I came back. I became more kind. I understood the deeper aspects of life. That is really powerful. And it's not just powerful for the person who has the experience, but just reading about it is powerful. Uh, yeah, and this is actually what they said, these researchers, the people who even read about these things are, are touched by this in a deep way. So this is what I mean by right view. It is that we, we understand these things more. We can become closer to it, emotionally closer. And when you become emotionally closer, it becomes a force that drives you on the path. If you really see a rebirth like that, it becomes visceral actually starts to have an effect in your life. Uh, it makes you change the way you live, the way you act. Uh, basically, you become a better person because of it. Uh, that is when it's powerful. Uh, so don't just read the suttas. Yeah, sometimes I think some of these ideas can expand a little bit on our view of that reality. Uh, so that's just the idea of, right, of rebirth, uh, which is one of the most fundamental ideas uh, of right view, and for that reason, really worthwhile contemplating a lot. It is fascinating, by the way, that the Te Vidja, the three true knowledges or the three insights of Buddhism, or the Buddha, is rebirth, kamma, and awakening. So rebirth, kamma, is, the, is, the, uh, uh, is like the uh, uh, mechanism that drives rebirth. And then you have the awakening experience, which is the ending of rebirth, yeah? the knowledge that you have ended rebirth. So all three of them are very closely related to rebirth. So we're talking about this is very, very core in the Buddhist teachings. So contemplate rebirth, uh, but uh, don't just contemplate rebirth. Uh, we have, the Buddha also talks about 
uh, in the suttas a large number of perceptions that we should develop. Yeah, and I find this very interesting. I consider this to be almost like vipassana practice. If anything is vipassana practice, I would say this is close. Uh, actually, I, I prefer still to think of vipassana as a result rather than an activity. But uh, you know, this is the kind of thing that drives that uh, res those results. Uh, and the perceptions that the Buddha talk about are, many of them are very straightforward and simple. Some of them, one of them is the marana sanya, yeah, the perception of death. Very important one in the suttas, probably the most important one. There's also marana sati, the recollection of death. And if you look at the, again, I, did an, I looked at a number of times various perceptions arise. The most important one, I think, was anicca sanya and then marana sanya, something like that. So um, these are... <clears throat> So these are some of the core ideas uh, that the Buddha says we should contemplate. Uh, and these are aspects of right view, right? Uh, when you contemplate impermanence, uh, that is exactly what right view is, really. Understanding the world as impermanent, unreliable, uncertain, out of control, all of these kind of things. Uh, yeah, Anicca sanya. So very, very useful because we have a tendency, to, tendency not to see that uh, uh, in our life. Uh, Marana sanya, the contemplation or perception of death, is also a kind of anicca sanya. Yeah, we're going to die. If you're going to die, what, other, what does that mean? And uh, what it means, it changes your attitude to the world. Uh, you look at things in a different way. Uh, you start to think about the long term. And especially if you have this idea of rebirth, uh, it means that the idea of rebirth combined with the idea of death uh, means, again, you start to look at things in a much longer term. Uh, why would you live now in such a way that you cause suffering for yourself in the future. That's crazy. It's like, I'm going to indulge now, and I don't care about what happens to me to tomorrow. That's kind of crazy person's way of thinking. Yeah. Of course, we should have a, an idea which kind of, where we create happiness for ourselves in the long run, now and also in the future. Not just now, and in the future, who cares? Yeah. Because you are letting yourself down if you do that. Yeah. And this kind of then changes our whole, whole attitude to the, uh, to the way we live our lives. Yeah. So, Marana Sanya, Anicca Sanya, very powerful perceptions. Uh, we start to align our way of looking at the world with the way the Buddha saw it. Uh, everything is always crumbling. Uh, yeah? Everything is always falling apart. Uh, the carpet is always being pulled out from under our, our feet. Uh, yeah? It's unreliable. The earth is always shaking. It's always like a low-level earthquake around. Yeah? You can't really stand. The moment you take a stand somewhere, the world is going to come and pull it out. Taking a stand is like attaching to something. Right? Uh, you're attaching. You're holding on. Uh, and then the earthquake gets stronger. Bang! You fall. Uh, especially if you live in California, uh, you have a. <laughs> so uh, this is uh, so, yeah. So this impermanence is actually very radical once you start to understand it fully, because in the moment uh, you don't know what can happen next. This is the idea of being able to have the idea of dying on your next breath, uh, as it says in the suttas. Uh. <laughs> It's hard to do, right? Could, like dying under next breath. Uh. Okay, tomorrow. Tomorrow is easier. Let's try tomorrow. Okay, die tomorrow. Okay, maybe we can do that one. Marana Sanya. Uh. Uh, there's lots of other perceptions. Another one which I sometimes like to do is the Sabbaloke Anabirati Sanya, the uh, non delight, uh, perception of non delight in the whole world. Uh. Yeah, and this is uh, the idea I often use when I kind of read the news. Uh, yeah, okay. War in Ukraine, climate change, refugee crisis, war in Syria, earthquake. I saw there was an earthquake recently in, in Turkey or whatever. Uh, uh, Trump being, becoming the president. I don't know. I didn't particularly like that. If I, I, may, I should be careful with politics, but I thought Trump, I'm not sure if that's a good idea. Um, <coughs> <laughs> and then all of these things in the world, you know, China and the U.S. kind of starting to clash with each other, talking about a new Cold War between China and the U.S. That's kind of bad news for everyone, all of us. So, and so you see all of these things, and you think, actually, the whole realm is rotten to the core. <laughs> core yeah? Can't hold on to this. There's nothing there. I, mean, I, I agree with people who say we should do things for climate change. We should do things for, you know, for the problems in the world. Yes, we should. Uh, but we shouldn't fool ourselves to think that we can actually make uh, change things. Uh, we may be able to help a little bit. Uh, we don't know where the world is going, don't, going to go. It may not you know, collapse completely. Maybe it will. Who knows what's going to happen? Uh, 
The point is that it is out of our individual grasp to save the world. This is kind of the fantasy of teenagers, right? I'm going to save the world. But once you grow up a little bit, you understand that you have very limited abilities to help out in the world. So you, you do what you can, but at the same time, you know that it's uncertain what's going to happen. And so you have this sabbaloke, anabirati sanya. Actually, the whole world, wow. And then, of course, yeah, this is where, because the whole world, what is that whole world? That whole world is the world of the five senses. So you're basically rejecting the world of the five senses. You're rejecting this thing that we are immersed in from morning to evening and even at night when we dream. That whole thing becomes, uh, you know, no good. And so you turn around and you go within instead and you find the refuge inside. And this is one of the reasons why meditation practice is so important because it gives you that refuge. It gives you this alternative place where you can give up that world outside. And then you have a place where it is not up to other people what happens to you, but it's up to yourself. It is up to you to develop that inner world. And that is why it is a refuge, because it doesn't depend on external things. So this is why it is so despairing not to have a refuge inside. Because if you have no refuge within, it means your refuge is going to be outside. And if that outside world is unreliable, going wrong, of course you're going to get depressed. Of course, you're going to get in despair, right? Because you haven't got any alternative. And so this shows you the power and the importance of the spiritual path. Because the spiritual path actually tell, gives you the answer to the problem of the world. When the world is out of control, there is another place to go. And that is the refuge within her. And that, of course, is a very important part of the whole spiritual path, the important part of right view, of understanding the world in the right way, where to find happiness, where suffering is to be found, understanding that refuge within her. So uh, sometimes when we use the idea, the, the so-called suffering in the world, when we use it in the right way, it becomes a very powerful impetus on the spiritual path. Yeah, the idea that the world is out of control, it starts to kind of point you in a different direction to find satisfaction, uh, to find uh, a sense of security and refuge. Uh, and that is the power of right view. Uh. So for someone who is of a spiritual bent, uh, a spiritual inclination, uh, actually the fact that the world is going down the drain, uh, actually uh, we, kind of, we kind of expected that anyway, right? Uh, it's just so unreliable, so uncertain. Uh. And so from that point of view, it just becomes more... Uh, grist for the mill, uh, more, okay, this is the path forward. Uh, now I know why the spiritual path is important. Uh, sometimes when the things are going too well in our life, we become complacent. Uh, yeah, everything is well, everything is okay, there's no problems, you know, I'm kind of, uh, and then we kind of become stupid. And that's why we suffer even more when then things turn out to be far more impermanent uh, than we uh, had uh, thought in our wildest kind of dreams. Uh, so, uh, there you are. There is such a thing as right view. Please uh, develop that right view, uh, mostly by reading the suttas, uh, understanding the word of the Buddha, try to see the world through the eyes of the Buddha. There's this beautiful uh, title the Buddha has called the, um, how does it go again, the eye of the world, the loka chakku or something like that. Uh, and so the Buddha sees, uh, yeah, he sees reality. And then he tells us, well, this is actually the way it is. Uh, and this is kind of the beginning of right view in the world. Then it passes that on to everyone else. And then we also have an opportunity to practice that same path and achieve the same results. Half an hour. Okay. All right, so, uh, so what do we do now? The questions? <laughs> okay. We have some questions. Yeah, one from the, from the live audience. So, 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 yeah, please. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, Rupert. Um, could you talk about, um, in the Metta Sutta, it says, by not holding to fixed views? I was wondering yeah. if you could talk about what, uh, what views could arise while developing Metta that we should not hold on to, that we should be where, uh, be What's the right view around metta, and how should we train ourselves in that regard? Yeah, um, 
I think that uh, that la this is in the last verse of the uh, Metta Sutta, right? Uh, Dittan Shanupagamma Silava Tasana. I think that verse is probably an addition to the original Sutta. It's not actually part of it because uh, I think uh, this was uh, Bhattasajato's uh, theory anyway, and usually he's pretty he's pretty clever when it comes to these things. So I, I take that until I have some evidence to the uh, contrary. I take that to be uh, accurate. Uh, and uh, so it, uh, it is added because it kind of, at, at a certain point, things go beyond the original uh, intention of a sutta. It's all about metta, but at the very end, it kind of takes everything to the end of the path, right? And this is kind of a tendency in the suttas where things have been added so as not to focus on the main subject of the sutta, but adding things to take it all to the very end. So it goes all the way to arahanship. An example of that is the Vitaka Santana Sutta, Majjhimanika 20, here. Yeah where the, um, it starts off with how to deal with thinking the mind, right? How to calm down the thoughts. Uh, and then it comes to the very end and says, well, then the, a person who practices in this way becomes uh, skilled in the ways of thought. They think whatever they want to think. They don't think what they don't want to think. Yeah. And then it goes on to go on to arahanship after that, uh, which kind of seems kind of out of place. And lo and behold, read the Chinese sutta, it stops, it doesn't have that last part on becoming an arahant. Yeah? It just stops when you become the master of the ways of thought. Uh, which is really what it is about. So that seems more likely to be correct. The other one seems to be likely to be added. And I think metta does a similar kind of thing. This has been added to the end. It doesn't really have that much to do with metta development. But uh, still, you can still you know, reflect on it and see actually what is going on there. And uh, I guess it is just a general statement about not holding on to views. Yeah, Dittansha Anupagamma doesn't go to views means not grasping these things, it probably refers to stream entry ultimately, something like that. Uh, and of course, when it comes to metta, again, it is the ancient Brahmanical views uh, that are problematic. Yeah, if you take this as God or Brahma and these kind of things, uh, this is where you have a problem. Uh, that's like we saw in the Majjhima 8 yesterday, the Salika Sutta, the Effacement Sutta, a similar kind of thing. Yeah. So you have metta, sure, but you understand it's a tool, it's not the, the final result on the path. Uh, yeah. A question from online here. Yeah. So Richard asks, how can the practice of sila foster a supportive foundation for the evolution and sustainability of right view? Uh, <clears throat> so uh, I think uh, I think there's a n probably a number of ways it can do that. Uh, but um, one of the ways is that when you, I think when you feel one of the things that sila does, it gives you a sense of value. Yeah? You feel a sense of self-worth. You feel a sense of uh, confidence about yourself because you know you're living well. And that gives rise to a natural kind of confidence within yourself. You don't care so much about what other people think anymore. And I think that opens your mind. Yeah? And it opens your ability to be more flexible as a person. Yeah? You don't feel you have to defend yourself so much in the, when other people challenge you or whatever. Yeah? So you become more confident, I suppose, in a deep sense of the term. And that allows you to be more, you know, to take things on board. You read the word of the Buddha and you kind of become, it's more easy to kind of accept those ideas that the Buddha sets out there. Uh, and also because your mind is less defiled, those ideas sink in, in a deeper way at the same time. So you have more ability to kind of deal with the, the challenges of the Buddhist path uh, because of that uh, sila that you have. So that's one way of thinking about it. Another way is that um, Right view is, in many ways, an aspect of sila in the suttas. You have the dasa kusala kamapata, the ten paths of wholesome actions, which is like maybe the most uh, detailed, uh, one of the more detailed descriptions of sila, of morality on the Buddhist path. Yeah? So you have the three kinds of good bodily conduct, the four kinds of good speech conduct, and then you have the three kinds of mental good conduct. And one of those is view, which is very interesting. View is considered good mental conduct. So if you develop sila according to this, actually view is included in that idea of sila. So, and what is that sila? Well, that is a sila about <clears throat> there is what is given, offered, and sacrificed. There is um, the fruits and results uh, of uh, our good and bad actions. There is this world and the other world. There's mother and father. There's spontaneously risen beings. There are beings in the world who see... Uh, well-practiced beings in this world who see this world and the other world. Something like that. I may have not got it quite right. but uh, uh, And so that is, very, again, very much focused around the idea of rebirth and all of that. Uh, yeah? It's actually part of our uh, 
yeah, of our sila in a in a sense. Uh, anyway, okay, good. Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? Uh, when you read it, you think, you think, of course there's not any father. Yeah, I mean, there's kind of given. Uh, so it can't mean that because it's kind of too obvious. Uh, so uh, I think it, um, if you look at the overall context, it's all about rebirth and karma, really. Yeah. So I think it has to do with the fact that uh, um, mother and father are karmically very powerful. Uh, um, kind of, uh, you know, you can make a lot of good or bad karma in relation to your mother and father. Yeah. Um, so that is one side of it. Uh, the other side is the fact that apparently there were certain sects at that time who said there isn't really mother and father. You, you know, you don't have any, you know, the way you come into the world, etc. is kind of uh, mother and father are irrelevant. I'm not sure exactly what those uh, sects were or how they phrased this, but they had some idea that you are entirely uh, self-determined in a certain way and as mother and father are irrelevant. Uh, but I think the main thing is that they are comically significant. And we know that in the suttas, yeah, if you kill your mother or father, it's very, very serious. Sir. But I think the opposite is also true. Huh? If you treat your parents well, it's actually comically very powerful. Huh? It really changes things. Sir. And uh, I, I, I remember when, when I became a monk, I, I, it's very interesting because I think about you know, you, everything. It becomes kind of, you tend to think about things in a personal way because that's kind of what your experience. Sir. My parents were really horrified when I wanted to become a monk. Yeah. They were kind of, what? We didn't bring you up to become a monk? What, is, what, are, you, <laughs> what are you thinking? They were really... And, uh, but, uh, and so, you know, you try to kind of... And when you're a young monk, you're really kind of keen on the Buddhist teaching, way over the top, yeah? So you try to convert your parents and everyone in sight, yeah? And you, it's kind of, kind of crazy. And you, you re recognize very quickly, this is very counterproductive. This doesn't work. This is not the way to do things. So I said, okay, let me instead live as a good monastic instead of... And then see what happens. Uh, and that over time, that actually did change things. That really was powerful. Uh, and uh, this was in part because I read things like there is mother and father. Uh, and that actually, gradually, they became more and more Buddhist to the point where basically my whole family was, well, not my sister, she was kind of an outlier, but my, the, rest of, the rest of them, they were pretty much Buddhist. Uh, yeah? and, uh, and that was extremely powerful for me. When I went back to my family, my father was, okay, give us a Dhamma talk and do some meditation together. Uh, with your family, right? Everyone was there. This is the most nerve-wracking Dhamma talk in your life, yeah? When <laughs> your family is there. Okay, everyone else is fine, but so my sister, her boyfriend, my brother, his girlfriend, their kids, my mother and father, was this group of family members. And, and, uh, but it's actually also very, very gratifying in a deep sense. The feeling that you actually have touched the people who are closest to you is actually really, really, really nice. And so, of course, I, of course I said yes when these things uh, were asked. Uh, and uh, so this is, I think, so you, you start to, there is mother and father, and you understand that actually if I can do something good for my parents, uh, it's going to be very, very powerful. Uh, and uh, so I, having read that, I tried that, and, it's, and it kind of gave some really nice results as well. Uh, so that's how I would understand that in terms of karma and rebirth, yeah. yeah. Yes, please, uh, Dan. I'm, I'm not sure if this is a, a stupid question or not, but can you explain... Can you clarify um, the difference between Dioniso Manasikara mm. and Sati Sampachanya? Um, okay. So I think, uh, I think Dioniso Manasikara is like a broader term that is used from the very beginning when you decide to become a Buddhist, yeah, or decide to follow the Dhamma, or decide to live morally, whatever. That's all Dioniso Manasikara. So if you go to the um, Sabhasava Sutta, the second Sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya, the, all the taints, uh, or all the defilements, uh, it specifically says that every time your mind is moving in a good direction, yeah, according to Dhamma, more good qualities, few bad qualities, uh, that is an instance of Yonis Omanisikara. You are reflecting in the right way. So you can see it's very, very broad. Uh, yeah? Every time you move in the right direction, it's Yonis Omanisikara. Every time you move in a bad direction, it's Ayonis Omanisikara. So this is a term that is relevant from the very beginning to the very end of the path. Uh, yeah, uh, every time you go forward, uh. Sati is uh, is also yon, it's included within Yonisomana Sekara, but it's like a subset of that. Uh. The Sati Sampajanya is what you see, the standard formula of uh, uh, when going forward, uh, you have 
uh, Satya Sampajanya, when going back, you have Satya Sampajanya, when stretching out your limbs, you have Satya Sampajanya, when eating, yeah, you know that formula, right? Uh, yeah. When uh, speaking, you have it, when, when sleeping, that's a very interesting one. When sleeping, you have Satya Sampajanya. What does that mean? Uh, okay, what it means is, and this is where I, I was really, I, I was disappointed when I saw Bhante Sujato having translated that way, because I, obviously it's wrong. How can you have Satya Sampajanya when you're sleeping here? Yeah? And so what it means, I, in my reckoning, and I was able to convince Bhante Sujato, it's very difficult to convince him, but in this case, <laughs> I was able to convince him, that it actually doesn't mean when you do these activities, but it is about these activities, yeah? So you have Satya Sampadana about sleeping here, yeah? or in regard to sleeping here. Yeah? So in other words, you know how much you should sleep, uh, yeah? You know the kind of the right way to sleep, the kind of thickness of the mattress, <laughs> or, or whatever it is, yeah? So it's about sleeping, which makes sense, because you have Satya Sampadana also about eating, right? How much should you eat? What is good food for you? All of these kind of things. So it's about the thing rather than a continuous awareness of what you're doing. Yeah. So Satya Sampajanya is, a, that is kind of the main area in the suttas. It refers to all the activities in your daily life that are not concerned with meditation, yeah? That you have clear awareness of whether this leads in the right direction or wrong direction. It's the, uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, suitability and purpose are two of the four sampajanyas according to the commentaries. I think they have really nice ways of looking at it. Uh, so is what I'm doing purposeful? Is it going to lead in the right direction? Is it suitable for leading uh, in, in, on, forward on the path? Uh, yeah. And so it concerns all. So it's a kind of a, a subset. So of course, when you do that, there's Yonasomana Sikara, but it's a subset of Yonasomana Sikara. Huh? So that's how I understand it. Of course, Satya Sampajanya then goes further because then you come to the Satipatthana Sutta and it says in the Satipatthana Sutta that you are Sampajano while you're doing Satipatthana practice as well. This is a higher kind. The first one is the kind of daily activities and then there's the higher kind of Sampajana in meditation. And there it means basically the same thing. Yeah. Now comes the other aspect of Sampajana which is Gochara Sampajana. And Gochara Sampajana means that you're staying with your with your meditation object, uh, yeah? So you're always staying with your meditation object. Uh, but that's only when you come to a mindfulness of breathing, yeah? You're staying with the, with the breath. It doesn't mean in ordinary life that you do that. Uh, so this is where that starts to happen. And then the higher, even higher ones is the, um, the um, non-self kind of idea of Sampajana. What is that called again? Uh, anyway, so there are layers, but it starts with just being aware of daily activities and whether you are doing it in a suitable way or not. Yeah, does that make sense? Mostly. Yeah, please, you come back, come back, please, please, you know. Yeah, you. <laughs> I think I'll have to contemplate. Yeah, okay, good, uh, yeah. Yeah, please, sir. Uh. Are you the obvious translator of this? You're so much gone as wise attention. Yeah. And to me, voice means wisdom is in work. Yeah, yeah. So that's something very special. Yeah. Uh, then, yeah. Yeah. it's clear comprehension. That's how I'm translating in English. Bikibodi's yeah. translation, yeah. 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 So, and, yeah. Uh, the, the voice attention, you know, Yoncho oh, yeah. is one of the four steps for Shotapa. Yeah, yeah. 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 So that's very special. Yeah. Yeah. So you know Parasu Paratogosa, which is the voice of another, like the Buddha. Um then it's Sila and and uh Samata Pipasana or no? Yeah, something like that anyway. Yeah. Okay. No no that's that, that's Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. No, that's, no, that's a different set. That's a different set. That's, uh, yeah, but anyway. Yeah. Do you have a number of questions from the audience? Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, so, take first that. off, so Dominique says, if the goal is to never return, where is gratitude? If the goal is to never return, where is gratitude? Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm not, okay, so I, I think the... Uh, uh, you want you, you have to have gratitude to, to never return. I think that's where it is. Uh, if you how how are you going to not not going to return uh, if you don't have gratitude? Uh, gratitude is like uh, is like one of the causes that actually makes you not return. Uh, so maybe that seems paradoxical because uh, 
gratitude means, I guess, uh, what are you saying here? You're saying that, uh, I'm not sure exactly what you're, what you're getting to, but uh, it, these are factors uh, on the path, uh, and that is really why you have things like uh, gratitude there. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but uh, try again if I didn't answer your question properly here. And Jay asks, did Buddha mention in the suttas about burning out bad karma? No, this is a Jain practice. Uh, it is interesting that it is actually mentioned in the suttas. Uh, there is a sutta in the Anguttara Tens uh, which talks about making an end of karma. And it has been studied extensively by scholars and it has been uh, basically concluded that very likely it is a Jain kind of uh, influence on the suttas that's come in from the outside. Uh, so uh, apart from those two or three occurrences in the Anguttara Tens, uh, uh, it doesn't occur in the suttas, uh, and uh, it is probably an external influence on the suttas. Yeah. And Sud asks, giving up attachment to the world of five senses and taking refuge in the Buddha, how is this related to metta? These seem to be two opposite things. Giving up the five senses and uh, taking refuge in the Buddha is opposite to metta? Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, and not really, because uh, the metta is actually doesn't really exist in the world of the five senses. Uh, what exists in the world of the five senses is more like romantic love and that sort of stuff. And romantic love is not the same as metta. Very important distinction there. So metta is a general feeling of goodwill towards all living beings, whereas uh, romantic love is a specific attachment to a particular person. It's, it's very, very different ideas. Uh, so uh, the idea of metta does actually precisely happen when you do give up the five senses, because that is where you have the ability to have this uh, broad idea of kindness towards all living beings. Uh, so uh, for this reason, it's interesting when you read the suttas, uh, the way that metta is taught in the suttas, uh, it is not taught uh, to have metta towards individuals, it's always metta towards directions, you know, to the whole world. Uh, you don't really find this idea of individuals. That's a later development from the Visuddhimagga. And uh, it's much more, uh, having metta towards individuals uh, is um, not necessarily wrong, but you have to be much more careful there, because when it comes to individuals, uh, there is often more attachments involved, there's more problems involved, uh, it's more easy to see the faults in individuals, uh, right? Uh, so very often defilements can arise much more easily. Uh, but if you have like just the north, all the beings to the north, well, it's kind of an idealized idea of beings. Uh, you know, there are lots of kind beings out there because there are lots of, there's a lot of kindness in the world, but because you don't tie it down to individuals, I think it's easier to have, it, have at that point. So I would say it works very well together, yeah? And that the idea of metta and giving up the five sense world actually goes together very well. Yeah? And Kumu asks, um, doesn't equanimity keep a check on the other three Brahmaviharas and all four are ultimately connected? And equanimity is rooted in insight and wisdom. Yeah, so equanimity is the highest of the four Brahma Vihara. So it kind of brings it all together uh, to, at the highest point. Uh, but it is important not to go straight to equanimity, but to actually practice metta and karuna first, uh, because these are more foundational and they will lead to upeka or to the highest equanimity down the track. Yeah. Uh, very often you can get a false kind of equanimity if you go straight to equ equanimity. There is a lower equanimity and a higher equanimity. And the, the lower equanimity is like sense restraint, uh, where the mind does not get attached or repelled by things in the world, but it stays equanimous. This is mentioned in the suttas only in a few places. Uh, it's kind of the lower equanimity. And then the higher equanimity is the equanimity of the four jhanas, uh, the equanimity of the seven factors of awakening and the equanimity of the Brahma Viharas. That's, they are roughly on par, they are the same. But to get to that kind of equanimity, you have to go through all the factors of the path, right? Either you have to go through the jhanas or the bojangas, or you have to go through the sequence of Brahma Viharas, starting with metta, practicing metta, then understanding the limitations of metta. So you go to karuna and understanding the limitations of those two. Why? Well, because they are very powerful positive feelings. And so you want to, if you have positive feelings, it's more close to attachment yeah, because of that. So, you, okay, you give that up as well. Huh? And then you go to equanimity, which is the highest one. Huh? But, uh, yeah, something like that. And actually, also on that theme of the four Brahma Viharas, um, I've often pondered on Mudita, mm -hmm. 
Mm. The word mudita itself just means uh, joyfulness. Mm. Um, but it's commonly uh, written as sympathetic joy or empathic joy or, or altruistic joy or other things. But that's actually adding an extra word that's not actually yeah. in the text. Yeah. And also reflecting on that, all of the other Brahma Viharas are universal qualities which are not tied to individuals and don't have a separation between, between me and them. Yeah. So it also always struck me as really strange to talk about joy in the good fortune of others because that's creating this mm. division between me here who I'm not having joy in this person's <laughs> good fortune, only yeah. the good fortune of those yeah. other people yeah. out there. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on this? Like is Murita yeah. a universal joy that includes oneself or is it specifically joy in the good fortune of people who are other than me? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I have also been struck by that particular uh, problem and have never really been sure about that. Uh, and uh, so, uh, but then I thought mudita or pamuj, pamuja, and these words, the way they are used some elsewhere in the suttas, they are often quite low quality. They're not very high qualities, you know. Uh, this idea of pamuja is a kind of before you get piti, before you get to pasadi, etc. So it's quite early on the path, whereas this one is after karuna. It's kind of, this is really, really high uh, so I, I, it must be something more than that. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. It has to be something. It has to be something very high. And so I sometimes I just uh, have to admit that I accept the commentarial ideas uh, because often the commentaries turn out to actually to be quite wise. After all, I this is one of the things that I have discovered over a long life. Initially, I rejected all commentaries, uh, and after a while, I thought, maybe that's have a point. Maybe I'm the one who's got it wrong. Right? That's happened so many times, uh, and. Not, surprise, not surprising, right? I mean, here is the accumulated wisdom of uh, hundreds of years of people who are very wise. Uh, and then I come, kind of whippersnapper, and I kind of reject it all, right? Uh, <laughs> and you realize that actually you're being arrogant and you're being conceited about your own understanding. Uh, and so sometimes when I, I'm in doubt about that, I, I mean, if there's very strong evidence that the commenters are wrong, sure, I, I, I will reject them. But uh, in this kind, kind of case, I think, well, maybe they have a point because I can't really see how it works otherwise. Uh, on the other hand, you have a point about this universality of things, right? How do you universalize that? Uh, um, yeah, not sure. Anyway, so yeah. 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 Uh, <coughs> uh, Neuron says, did you know your previous lives? If yes, how many lives do you know? Uh, you're asking me how many lives I know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, next question, please. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and that's the last question. Um, so, no, one, one, from the audience, yeah, please. Uh, uh, in terms of the conversation of Mudita, I heard a translation, I believe it's by Ajahn Chat, and he says in the, uh, the, one of the sutras of the Buddha teaching Rahula, he says uh, the translation is developed meditation on appreciation. When appreciation is developed, resentment will be abandoned. So is Mudita this appreciation for effort, like have, figuring, like in certain teachings there is the idea that everyone has been our mother. And so if we kind of contemplate the kindness uh, okay. that everyone has, yeah. has uh, given us, that is yeah. universal Mudita. Yeah, maybe something like that. Yeah, okay, that's an interesting point. Yeah, maybe you can do it in that, that kind of way. But I think that's a, I think that's a very powerful contemplation anyway, that everyone has been your family member one way or another. It's really powerful. And because it uh, just gives a completely different angle from looking at other people. Uh, and uh, you kind of you open up to things that, like a mother loves her only child, regardless of what that child does, right? If they become a mass murderer, mother still forgives that child probably. I guess there is a limit at some point. But uh, And so this kind of, it's a very powerful thing. And so, yeah, maybe, maybe, yeah. On that, um, if people in their lives have, uh, in, through ignorance, like uh, made bad karma with their parents, you know, have resentment towards uh, their parents, what uh, I'm thinking about the sutta of the salt in the glass and the salt uh, in the lake, how does one best with, uh, repay their kindness or for, ask for forgiveness, or what's the way to practice in order to make good karma and, uh, you know, be and, and I know that we have to accept we can't change the bad karma. Yeah. How should one, uh, now that they have wisdom and have heard the teachings, how do we repay our parents and, and ask for forgiveness? Yeah. yeah, just ask for forgiveness, yeah. And just 
So, you know, I did many stupid things as a young, you know, please uh, forgive me. I'm sorry about all of that. I was, I was silly. You know, now I see things differently. Uh, let's be kind to them, you know. Uh, and uh, that's, yeah, that's going to be very powerful when you do that. I think parents, because parents are very, are closer to the children than the children are to the parents usually. Uh, and so uh, sometimes from a child's point of view, you, you kind of, you reject them, but you don't really understand the bond from the parents' side. Uh, so it, it becomes very powerful when you, when your child actually does understand that, yeah, and then you kind of ask for forgiveness or whatever. So I think that's a very beautiful thing to do. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, excellent. Good. Yes, Dad. Um, I think that I need uh, as much uh, advice on equanimity as I can get. I feel like this is a, a large part of my practice right now. But yeah. um, so that I only have one question for you, um, I'll, yeah. I'll just stick with... Um, can you explain the difference between equanimity as a Brahma Vihara and equanimity as a Bhojanga? I, I don't think there is really any particular difference. I think it's very, very closely related to each other. Uh, maybe the difference would be that, uh, yeah, I'm actually not even sure. I think they're basically the same thing. Yeah, uh, that's what I would say. Yeah. Uh, because the equanimity as a bojanga is would be the fourth jhana state, right? Uh, would be that uh, you kind of go through samadhi, uh, and samadhi are the jhanas, and then the highest jhana experience is the fourth jhanas. I would say it's the fourth jhana, and the upeka that you get from the Brahma Viharas. Uh, I guess it depends a little bit on the way you get into these states, because the way might um, affect exactly, especially how it, it feels afterwards when you come out of them, right? Uh, the, so if you have a lot of metta going into a jhana, for example. Uh, the experience after the jhana may be more imbued with that metta because you entered it through metta. And using the breath uh, will then have a different experience when you come out afterwards. Uh. So the pathway in may affect a little bit how these things are experienced. Uh, but uh, I think in, in essentially they are the same thing as far as I understand it. To clarify, I don't have <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, so th uh, this is the thing. So most of us, we just need to kind of work on the... Uh, don't think of it as a... Brahma Vihara Upeka. I think of it as ordinary Upeka in daily life. Yeah, the kind of Upeka of not being attached and repelled by ordinary sensory existence. Uh, that's kind of the main thing. And that's kind of a, a lower Upeka compared. But I mean, it's still very, very valuable, right? Uh, so I think that is the main kind of ma main area of work for the majority of people. Can you point me where to read more about the lower and higher equanimity? Uh, start with uh, Majjhima fifty. Uh, the uh, Portalia Sutta, 54, Ajma 54, and that has uh, has both of those upekas in it. Uh. Yeah. Okay, shall we call it a... Uh, is there one more question? Or? No? No? Okay. Yeah. So, Great. Uh, thank you, Ajahn, for sharing teachings with us, and this is Ajahn Brahmali's final Dhamma talk here at Empty Cloud Monastery for the time being. Hopefully he'll come back again and at some point in the future. So at this time, we'll express our appreciation with three sadhus. Sadhus!